late one evening in the year 1603. James Stuart, King of Scotland and heir to the throne of all England, was roused from his bed. Outside his bedchamber stood an exhausted and bloodied messenger. The nobleman, hoping to win a bit of royal favor, had ridden three days straight to Edinburgh to be the first to bring him the news that would soon shake the entire English-speaking world. Elizabeth, Good Queen Bess, the Virgin Queen, was dead. Britain's only monarch over the past 44 years had indeed passed. And now James Stuart, King James VI of Scotland, would soon be crowned James I, King of England, Scotland, and Ireland. The contrast between the two monarchs, Elizabeth and James, couldn't have been more dramatic. Elizabeth was an icon and a legend, a beloved and imperial ruler, resolutely unmarried and childless, a master politician who had presided over a golden age, the Elizabethan age. But her policies and her leadership had, like the queen herself, grown old and tired. Her motto was, Semper Edom, always the same. So England was ripe for change. Enter a man for such a time as this, James Stuart, son of the beautiful and ambitious Mary Queen of Scots, a family man, an avid hunter and outdoorsman, and a bona fide intellectual. England had never seen a king quite like him. James was a published scholar, an accomplished linguist, an aspiring poet, a patron of the stage and of the academy. A man who once said, were I not king, I would be a university man. But it was one scholarly enthusiasm in particular that would forever seal the new king's place in history. He was fascinated with texts of the Bible. Even as a young man, he liked to amuse himself with the crafting of his own translations of scripture as he moved comfortably among English, Latin, Greek, and French. England's new king, while brilliant, did not cut a particularly royal figure. He was pale and unattractive, red-headed and red-faced. His court portraits usually show a thin face framed by an unkempt auburn mustache and a pained, somewhat suspicious expression. But however ill-suited James may have appeared for the formal trappings and affairs of state, he was a man of no small talent and vision, and his ascendance to the throne marked the dawning of a new England. His personal choice of a Latin motto was Beati Pacificae, from the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers. While historians have long debated the successes of his political efforts to win a lasting peace, it would be his Bible, the Bible whose translation he would authorize and with which his name would be forever associated, that would be his greatest gift to humankind, the most powerful expression of King James' vision of world peace. It didn't take England's newly minted king long to set into motion the wheels of a new English translation of the Bible. In 1604, only a few months after his coronation, James called together a conference at Hampton Court Palace to hear the concerns of religious leaders about things pretended to be amiss in the church. It was from this assembly of clergymen and scholars that a call came, somewhat unexpectedly, for a new translation of the Bible, which was answerable to the truth of the original manuscripts of Scripture. When James heard their request, his response was eager, swift, and decisive. Over the previous 75 years, no fewer than 50 different English versions of all or parts of the Bible had been published. The Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, to name a few. But none had satisfied either James or the leaders of the Church of England, much less captured the devotion and support of the common worshiper. 
King James convened a committee of the realm's finest translation specialists and charged them to produce a scholarly improvement of the widely used Bishop's Bible of 1568. But what he got was beyond even his most ambitious expectations. An English translation that would forever bear his name and would outstrip all other versions for the next 400 years. Let's use our imaginations, go back to 1604, and listen in on one of the many conversations that must have taken place in the handsomely outfitted and well-used library of King James I, say between the King and Robert Cecil, the first Earl of Salisbury. The hour is late, Majesty. I know, Robert, but stay a while longer, I beg you. I'm much too gripped by the bishop's request to sleep tonight. The request for the new Bible, you mean? Yes. You know that I have never yet seen a Bible I thought well translated into English. How long must we be tormented by a profusion of inadequate versions? Such pathetic excuses for the Word of God, so full of errors, so blighted by the marginal notes of uninspired academics and clerics, or just so plain unreadable. You do not favor the Bishop's Bible either, I take it? No nor the Great Bible, nor the Coverdale Bible, nor the Matthew Bible, none of which can hold a candle to Tyndale's work of four decades ago, the translation that cost him his life. Do you know the story of Tyndale? William Tyndale, once declared a heretic by the church, now admired as the father of the English Bible? What a passion was Tyndale's! What a revolutionary vision that a day might come in England when even a literate plowboy might possess and read for himself a copy of the Word of God. And he did it! Tyndale did it! Broke the stranglehold of the ecclesiastical power elite, released the captive text of Scripture, and gave the man on the street a faithful rendering of the holy book that flowed straight from the Hebrew of Isaiah and the Greek of Paul. And do you know Tyndale's last words, his dying prayer, as they burned him at the stake? He prayed, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Well, Robert, this King of England has no intention of turning a blind eye to the need for a better Bible. The time is now. In seven short years, by 1611, the translator's work was done. Their meticulous scholarship and inspired poetry had produced a classic work that realized King James' vision and more. Their final product was grandly dedicated to the most high and mighty prince, James, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith. It would pass through several states of revision, but within a few years, the King James Version had become the Bible of the world's English-speaking people and would remain the dominant English voice of God's Word for most of the next four centuries. The impact of the King James Version of the Bible on Western culture, and in particular, on the English language, is incalculable. Salt of the earth, an eye for an eye, our daily bread, Pearls before swine, a wolf in sheep's clothing, the blind leading the blind, the signs of the times, all expressions we heard first in the King James Bible. One conservative estimate is that English speakers today use over a thousand sayings from the King James Version, probably with no awareness that they're quoting from the Bible. The King James Bible has arguably been judged the greatest work of prose in the English language and is in large part responsible for the Bible becoming the best-selling book of all time, the only book known to have more than one billion copies in print. Even one of the most prominent skeptics of the modern era, George Bernard Shaw, was moved to write admiringly of the King James translators. They carried out their work with boundless reverence and care and achieved a beautifully artistic result. They made a translation so magnificent that to this day, the common human Britisher or citizen of the United States accepts and worships it as a single book by a single author 
the book being the book of books, and the author being God. While there are several reliable contemporary translations available, many modern readers have been drawn to the New King James Version, a fifth revision of the original, which features updated vocabulary and grammar, while striving to preserve the classic style and literary beauty of the original 1611 version. As the King James Version now approaches its 400th anniversary, the world prepares to celebrate the enduring power and influence of the one translation that has inspired and nurtured readers from the Elizabethan age to the computer age. But this anniversary is much more than a mere publishing event. It is a marking of the astonishing continuity of the Scripture's place in our hearts and in our culture, a recognition of our deepest legacies of faith and family, and a celebration of the power of the Word of God in our lives and our world. For many of us, our family Bible is a King James Bible, the lovingly worn old volume passed down across generations, entrusted with the precious documentation of our family births, marriages, and deaths, whose margins are filled with the wisdom and the highlighting of our mothers and our grandfathers. The King James translation remains one of the top-selling Bible translations in the world, 400 years old and going strong. How do you explain the appeal of a translation now so far removed from the time and the culture that birthed it? In his biography of King James I of England, writer David Teams used one word to honor the king who commissioned its creation and to capture the genius of the inspired work itself. Majesty. Maybe that, most of all, is what sets this version apart from all others. The King James Bible is, in a word appropriate to the God revealed within it, truly majestic.